Hi, I'm Paul. And I'm Ming. And welcome to Skip the Rulebook, the show that steals the complication from the rulebook and fences you a ready-to-play game. Today we'll be divvying up the spoils in Thief's Market. In this game you'll be thrust into a den of thieves, negotiating, threatening and of course stealing to get your fair share of the bounty in our latest dastardly heist. Will you end up as the most notorious or simply an example to kids that crime doesn't pay? Let's skip the rulebook. Shall I need this? The first thing out of the box are the player reference cards. While the core mechanics of Thief's Market are relatively straightforward, these cards will give you a helping hand in deciphering the large range of icons and symbols present in the game. Next are the gold coins. These are used as one of the currencies to hire goons and buy items to strengthen your position in the gang. The infamy tokens are used to keep track of your points and ultimate standing among the thieves. A large proportion of the game will revolve around the acquisition of these market cards. They represent the various henchmen and items that you can purchase during the game in order to do anything from gaining notoriety to fencing loot. The central mechanic of Thief's Market revolves around these loot dice. These cool looking dice are the loot that you'll be vying for your share of during each round. Last but not least, we have the starting player token, which not only denotes the starting player, but is also another commodity which can be stolen by other players during the game. Thief's Mark can be played with between three and five players, so today we are joined by Omar, Thief Extraordinaire. Begin by dishing out one reference card to each player. As well as being your crib sheet during gameplay, these also give you a helping hand during setup. The number of dice that you use during gameplay is dictated by the number of players. Since we only have three players, we'll be using 10 of the 13 dice. Place these in the centre of the game area. It's important that you choose a space that can be reached by all players. Next, we need to set up the market. The market cards are split into three types labelled A, B and C. Draw 13 cards from deck A, 12 from deck B and 11 from deck C. Place these in the play area, leaving space next to each deck. Any unused cards should be placed back in the box without looking at them. They will not be used during this game. Finally, draw five cards from the top of deck A. This will form our starting market. Next we should place the piles of gold coins and infamy tokens in a place where each player can reach them ensuring that each player receives one gold coin. Thank you. Finally, we must allocate the starting player. This should be the last player who stole something. I have a feeling this game may end up airing some secrets. Mm -hmm. The aim of Thief's Market is to gain notoriety points. This can be done in one of a few ways, including purchasing certain market cards and by collecting infamy tokens. The game is played over a number of rounds, each round is split into two phases, the loot phase and the purchasing phase. To begin a round, the starting player should take the loot dice and roll them. Then place the starting player token next to the pile of dice. This is our pile of loot for this round. The dice, along with the starting player token, are collectively referred to as objects. Next, the starting player can choose to take as many of these objects as they wish. Simply choose the dice and place them in front of you ensuring that you don't change the face of the dice as you're moving them. You can also choose to take the starting player token. There are a number of symbols on the dice which will detect the ones you decide to take. I have initially elected to select two blue gems and one white. There are four colours of gems, red, white, green and blue, which will be used as currency to purchase the market cards in the later phase of the game. Once the starting player has made their choice, play passes clockwise to the next player. Subsequent players have a choice of actions. They can either choose any number of objects from the central pile, as did Ming, or they can elect to steal the entire pile from another player. Should you elect to steal the loot from another player, you take all of the objects from the pile in front of them and place them in front of you instead, including the starting player token which they may have had. Once again, be careful not to change the face on any dice as you transfer them over. <laughs> Unfortunately, this act does have a cost. 
If you elect to steal the goodies from one of your opponents, you must return one of those objects back to the central pile. If this is a dice, you must re-roll it. You may be wondering why you'd elect to return more than one object. This is simply a means by which to reduce the number of objects in your pile and thus make it a less tempting target for other players to steal from. For my turn, I'm going fishing for gold. While the gem tokens are handy for buying market cards this turn, they can be limited depending on what cards are on offer. The yellow bag symbols can be traded in for gold coins, which are another currency. These can be used in place of gems of any colour. The downside is that these are not traded in for gold coins until the end of the round. This means that they cannot be used for purchases this round. They will however set me up nicely for future turns. Play continues to move around clockwise until all players have a pile of loot in front of them. Since I had my pile rather unceremoniously stolen by Omar, I currently have no loot, and therefore get another go. I could exact revenge by stealing the pile straight back off Omar, but since each theft requires you to discard one object, this would leave me with a rather meagre result. So instead, I'm going to choose to take the objects from the middle. If during a round you are the last player to take loot from the middle, you must take all of it. What a shame. This means that at the end of each round, there should be no loot left in the middle. Among the dice that I've gained this turn is a new symbol we have not yet seen, the purple masks. These dice are traded in at the end of the round for infamy tokens, which give me points at the end of the game. This means, in essence, each die carrying this symbol will get me one point. Now that we each have our little piles, we move on to the second phase, purchasing. The purchasing phase begins with a player who had the starting player token at the end of the loot phase, in this case, me. We now get a chance to purchase cards from the market using the gems we just gained. The cost of each card is denoted by the symbols on the left hand side. This card, for instance, costs two blue gems. The choice of which card to purchase can be a tricky one, because the abilities gained last throughout the remainder of the game. I'll begin by purchasing this card. As you can see, it costs one blue gem. So I'll take my one die with the same symbol and place it back to the center pile, showing that I've paid. The symbol on this card means that I can spend one blue gem to gain one infamy token. The abilities on purchase cards can be used immediately, meaning I can spend my remaining blue gem and gain one infamy token. You may only purchase one card per turn unless you have a card which allows you to purchase more. The player clockwise to me will now do the same. Since my yellow bag symbols aren't worth anything this turn, that means I've got two red gems to spend, so I'm going to buy this Bondsman card. As with Omar, I pay the cost by placing the dice back into the center pile and then take the card. I'm going to begin by spending one white gem to purchase the corrupt official. This slightly complicated icon means that once all the loot has been divided up, if my stash contained at least one white gem, I get to buy an additional card. Since my stash did contain a white gem, although I've already spent it, I can buy one more card. Unfortunately, I only have one blue gem left to spend. This is where the gold coins come in handy. A gold coin can be used in place of one gem of any colour, so I'm going to use my blue gem plus my one gold coin to purchase this glamour card. At the end of the round, all yellow bag dice are turned in for one gold coin each, meaning I get two. Similarly, all purple mask dice are turned in for one infamy token each, meaning Ming gets two. Then any unspent dice are returned to the center. We must now replenish the market. Since four cards were bought from deck A this turn, we must now turn over four new cards. If at any point there are not enough cards in deck A to replenish the row, we immediately turn over five new cards from deck B. Similarly, once you get to the stage in the game where there are not enough cards in deck B to replenish the market, you immediately turn over five cards from deck C. All face-up cards are then available to be bought in the purchasing phase of later rounds. The round begins the same as the first, with the starting player rolling the dice. And then returning the starting player token back to the centre. 
The game then plays out as described earlier. The game continues until at the end of a round there are not enough cards in deck C to replenish the cards that are bought. For this point the game ends immediately and players should tally up their points. Players gain points for any of their market cards carrying purple laurels and also for any infamy tokens that they have collected. There are also two additional means of gaining points, which only come into play at the end of the game. The player with the most number of cards carrying the henchman symbol will gain three bonus points. The player with the second highest number will gain one additional point. The player with the most gold coins will gain three bonus points. There is no second place for gold coins. If there is a tie in any of these cases, each player will receive one fewer point than they would have done otherwise. The winner is the player with the most notoriety points. If there is a tie, the player with the most cards wins. If there is still a tie, the player with the most infamy tokens wins. If, after all that, there is still a tie, then the first player to grab the starting player token, shout, you fools, mwah ha ha, and run out the door, will be the winner. You fools! Ah! Thief's Market is a very well thought out game in which every action requires serious consideration. Should you take all of that loot? Or will that mean that somebody else will just steal it from you? But what if you don't? Will that mean that the other players have then got one up on you in the purchasing phase? Each round is fast paced enough that everybody will feel engaged throughout. The option to backstab your mates will also lead to some very funny moments. Even when it's not your turn, you'll likely be enthralled by watching your mates create mini cold wars by stealing the starting player token or purchasing the card that the other guy really needed. Thief's Market will definitely be getting some serious playtime here at Skip the Rulebook. The only truly tricky aspect of Thieves' Market is the symbols on the market cards and figuring out what they mean. While you can refer to the back of the rule sheet to find out the meaning of each individual card, you'll find that you soon get used to the more common symbols, with the aid of the reference sheet. For example, this symbol means you can change the face of this die to something else, and this one means you must discard a die of this type. Once you wrap your head around this, the tactical play comes in and you'll find yourself agonising over every move you make. That's it from us at Skip the Rulebook. If you've enjoyed this video, please hit like. If you want to hear more from Skip the Rulebook, press subscribe. You can also find out more about us on Facebook, Twitter and SkipTheRulebook.com. Keep your eyes out for a Just Play video to watch us play Thieves Market from start to finish with our friends. Join us next time for your chance to jump into that new board game without having to do any tedious rule reading. See you later. Imagine if you're in the... I picked up this box. Cars, cheese melts. <laughs> We're not sponsored by them. <laughs> That's right. And then throw them away! <laughs> I'm just going to dine on my curry hands for the next five minutes. <laughs> oh, that's good. Just like... That's what, well, that's what I do after I stick them in my bum. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's not that great. Mm. Oh, I do want to be beside the seaside. Bum. <laughs> 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 yeah. Fishing for what? Ah! <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I'm a load-bearing Omo. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blow the arms. Nuclear power. <laughs>